First of all, I'm Eric Julia Tisdale. Uh, I, I conducted the researches for band councils for uh, uh, mostly it, this very specific research started in 2012-2013 at the 200th of the uh, of the war of 1812. I conducted a bachelor in uh, major in history and a minor in social sciences at Lucam University of Quebec in Montreal. Uh, I also studied paralegal at uh, O'Sullivan College, so a completely different field. So today uh, I want to expose you uh, what happened uh, with those who managed uh, the militia of the so-called warriors from the annexed to the Voltigeur militia of Lower Canada, how it was conducted and uh, who were the actual uh, administrators of this militia part of the militia so first of all uh, the uh, the existence of the uh, Iroquois missions because we're mostly going to be focusing on the Iroquois who took part in the warriors militia 1664 to 1668 about three quarters of the Onondagas and 60% of the Mohawks from the five, uh, uh, the five nations Odenosone League, the Iroquois Confederacy, were actually captives when that captives. So many people back then were trading uh, children seasonally within the Algonquins. Uh, Otherwise, sometimes there were conflicts between nations. Uh, the children were taken with uh, women. Sometimes it was an eye for an eye. When a man got killed in a, in a combat, in a conflict, the year after, another man was taken to equalize to a certain extent. So uh, everybody, all the captives then, they all integrated the band. They were... They were adopted to a certain extent. So uh, each year, intertribal meetings, wampum trading uh, gatherings were happening yearly, sometimes seasonally. Uh, it's all uh, a little bit speculative to a certain extent because we do rely on the archives, though there are archives that we're not aware of quite potentially, so we always have to keep that part in mind. Uh, so that was from the evaluation of the, uh, the mixed, uh, the adoption and the captives and so on, around 1664, 1668, 70% of the Onondagas and 60% of the Mohawks were captives from uh, when that captive. In 1665, the French Regiment Carignan Salière uh, was called in New France uh, since the various attacks from the Iroquois towards the French. The Iroquois then were connected with the Dutch. And uh, there were still many Wendats within those Iroquois against uh, the French and next with the Dutch. Salier arrived in 1665. The intendant Jean Talon, representing the king, organized three pre peace treaties in 1666. Though before the third peace treaty, on September 1st, 1666, Talon sent a letter to his subdelegates Tracy and Courcel, exposing that it, it was entitled A Memory to Talon of Talon to Tracy and Courcel to show that it is currently more advantageous to make war to the Agnie, Agnie Norans, the Iroquois, the Mohawks, than to conclude peace with them. So therefore, the, the main goal of the French colony was to reach the Great Lakes, to develop towards the Great Lakes for the fur trade. Though conflictual with the Mohawks allied with uh, the Dutch, eventually with the English, so that's why they brought the uh, Jean Talon Carignan, uh, the Carignan Salier Regiment. The survivors of that 
so-called third treaty that ended up with a slaughter. <laughs> Uh, they were uh, brought to the mission around 1667. Uh, it was called Kentucky then, next to La Prairie, like between Ch Longueuil and Chalegay, basically. And uh, that was the first mission that eventually moved to Ganawali. So that that's like the root of uh, that village to a certain extent. So what we see on the plate, on the slide there, it's the uh, the commemorative plate that was set in Ganawagi on the 200th of the War of 1812. I'll explain that a little bit later. And that's a book that I uh, I started conducting since uh, we obtained funds at the Band Council in Ganesataki to associate those who, those who took part in the War of 1812 from Ganesataki, though since they already had problems with the administration of the uh, Sulpicians and so on, very few, a lot less from Ganesataki took part in the War of 1812 because they, they were having problems with the, all the crown lands belonged to the government. The only crown land that was given to a religious order was two mountains. Uh, so therefore, in 1717, the king gave the land to the Sulpicians. In 19, 1721, they moved the mission that was then a uh, Ansic, north of Montreal. Oops, they moved to Ganesataki. And it didn't belong to the crown, it belonged to uh, the Sulpicians. <laughs> so therefore, uh, the Mohawks, they get fooled to a certain extent other conflicts. They had their own thing to to take care of first. So the book, it's a, there's a copy at the Library of Archives Canada, the uh, the Montreal BANQ, Bibliothèque and Archive Nationale du Québec. It's already, it's online as well at Library and Archives Canada. So it's called 1812-1815 uh, Ganesataki Oka. I, I wrote Oka just for everybody to to be able to rely to find it it's it's simpler so though even though the titles it's called Ganesataki uh, Oka Warriors it's mostly Ganawagi Warriors at the end <laughs> we all found out that uh, the conference I made in 2014 at the University of Quebec of Montreal similar to this one and then uh, I started writing in the Eastern Door, it's a weekly uh, paper from Ganawagi that won uh, quite a few years in a row the best uh, community newspaper uh, from Canada. And actually that's really interesting because on the picture we see the artist, the paint called painter called Dominique Duchamp. And back then in the, the sites of Patrimony Canada, and uh, uh, bibliography of Canadians and so on. That picture kept on being shown until they discovered that it wasn't Dominique Duchamp, but an artist called Dominique Duchamp. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there we are. So I re-edited that part on the, the little book there from uh, that I... So it's actually a pianist and organist and music educator that was often wrongfully associated with Dominique Duchamp. So it has been corrected. I know that the Genealogical Society of Oka kept on telling me just to do that change. Well, I did it now. <laughs> so uh, in order to associate those that took part in the, in the militia of the so-called warriors, I had to go through the parish registers and the censuses in order to associate the names with those who received medals to try to make the, uh, the right association. So I had to transcribe a bunch of parish registers. Voila now is the new search engine for uh, researches that are put online at Library and Archives Canada. So if you go on Voila and you type Eric Pouliatis there, you'll, you'll find the uh, censuses those parish registers and the little booklet I made on the warriors. So of course the history, the conflict of the history, it all started out with the uh, 
Napoleonic Wars. I won't go too deeply into that part, though it is very interesting. Uh, the little uh, conflict mostly started around uh, on June 1807. An incident occurred there, uh, nine miles of the American coastlines, the British HMS Leopard boat mounting 54 guns hails to the American U.S. Shakespeare, another boat mounting 40 guns. They were not officially at war, though the British Leopard uh, started some sort of investigation claiming that there were people legally wanted, uh, that they would have custody of, uh, of people, so they did the inspection on the American boat and they sized uh, four Irishmen. One of them actually had a warrant in England, uh, but the others, uh, they were uh, innocent. <laughs> so that was the first, like, first step, the, the, the step that started the conflict, basically. And then the actual war was, uh, was called in June 18, 1812. The Senate voted, and here we go. The war started. <laughs> so uh, the North American, those that took part in the war, uh, here I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, yeah, the Napoleonic Wars from 1893 to 1812. And actually, it even got, uh, after the war was con finished, con conducted, there was a little conflict in the... Uh, in uh, New Orleans, and uh, nobody really won. The Americans, they, uh, they won towards a little militia of Englishmen that wanted to keep New Orleans, actually. But uh, at the end, everybody retreated their, uh, their claims towards, well, I mean, the English retrieved their claims towards New Orleans. And it just stayed like a neutral. Nobody really re-talked about this part afterwards. Uh, so to do recognize the essential participations of the Ar Aboriginal peoples, 48 medals were given to, uh, to participants in the uh, Warriors Militia, though it was given in 1846-47 when most Warriors passed away. <laughs> So it was a uh, pretty uh, pretty late actually. Uh, of course, there were uh, mostly Mohawks that are recorded, and those that received medals. But there was also Algonquins, because uh, when the mission was created, let's say uh, in Ganesataki in uh, 1721, when they moved from Ansik to Ganesataki. Uh, the Algonquins that were mostly living around Timiskaming and Val d'Or and so on, and on the on to, between Timmins and Val d'Or, back then called Timiskaming, they spent a few months around uh, around Ganawagi, uh, Ganesataki, so they were recorded there. So a few got hired in the militia back then. So uh, yes, they were given certain uniforms and so on that we're gonna see. So I won't on that these are the uniforms some uh, reconstru reconstructions these are from Ronald V Volstead from the Department of National Defense of course there's many variants uh, from a conflict to another and I guess that they probably lost uh, parts of their suits during the conflict so it started like that <laughs> So that's the, the plate that was uh, set forward, put in Kanawagi at the 200. And uh, I think I got a little history about that, that part. Yeah, the Mohawk uh, Legion Branch two, two, uh, 219 invited the Consul uh, General of Canada and the U.S. Consulate 
in Montreal for the celebration, which was the 21st of June, 2012. So it was, uh, and that, that very monument is in front of the uh, St. Francois Xavier Church in Ganawagi. So there's a, a few names of uh, warriors who took part in it. And what's really interesting is the, the orthographic fo formulas. Uh, Anaisha was the Mohawk name. And the second name is the, 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 the first name. So Saro went for Charles. Sawatis went for phonetically Jean-Baptiste, though Jean-Baptiste was John. Saro for Charles. Wiche for Michel, Mike. Ineas for Ineas, eventually Angus. Uh, so we see Roren went for Laura below. Uh, Rowi for Louis. Atonsa, Atonwa went for Thomas. Razar, Lazar on the top right. Ineas, uh, Ineas, Angus. Sakari, strangely, usually it would be Zachary, though it was probably Angus Zachary. Uh, Aton sa aton wa. Sac for Jacques, some say James, Thierry for Pierre, and so on. So it was very phonetic back then. So uh, I exposed it there. Arene, Ker, Pierre, Moses, Maïs. So very phonetic wise. Mostly those from uh, Ganawagi, Saint Regis, aka Aquasafne, some Nipissings and Algonquins that were baptized or got married at uh, within a month or two that they spent around the Two Mountains Lake, and uh, some Abenakis from Saint Francois took part in the battles. So these are the main four battles: Queenston, Odeltown, Shadigay, Beaver Dams the main battles in which those from Lower Canada associated with the Vultures went. So we see the Battle of Chardigui on the top right there, next to La Cove. Uh, that's a map that if, if you type down Battle of Chardigui, you will see that map. It's been provided by Patrimony Canada. And we have uh, the victories and the loss <laughs> of the battles. So, uh, of course, there's the famous history of Laurent Secard around Beaver Dams, though uh, it's, 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 to a certain extent, a little bit fantastical, because we have the history that's been released by a, a few different voices. So, uh, which one is the right one? It's, it's, it's kind of hard. Uh, I won't put too much emphasis on our case, let's say. <laughs> it's been overwhelming, overwhelmingly publicized. This one is very interesting. Uh, Dominique Duchamp, who was actually the, uh, the, the so-called uh, Indian agent responsible for the natives of Ganesatagi, uh, a.k.a. Oka, he was getting happy to see that the Mohawks were being uh, recognized basically almost as citizens, uh, as being great participants and so on. Though Michel de Salaberry, the lieutenant colonel, uh, expressed uh, his disagreement because many people still, they got captured, some got scalped, and he tried to uh, to smooth down the uh, that 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 customary it became customary after a few generations unfortunately but the scalps so he was trying to uh, Michel de Salaberry tried to uh, drive people towards capture them but don't uh, don't kill them so here's the uh, the how the the conditions for raising the Canadian Voltigeur the French militia so the court to consist of His Majesty's subject born in Canada to be raised to serve during the apprehension of the United States of America. The corpse to be furnished with arms and accoutrements of clothing and expenses at the expenses of the government. Uh, and the last point, very interesting, 
An additional company formed of Indians will be allowed to be attached to this corp, consisting of six chiefs and sixty warriors. This company will be armed, clothed after their own manners, and victually, uh, meaning fed, at the expense of the government. They will receive presents as a reward instead of pay. It was approved by and signed by Georges Prévost, the commander in force. So those who received medals that we're going to see in the list a bit later are from those three uh, exact combats. Battle of Detroit, of Chattagic, and of Chrysler Farm. Here's the list of those who uh, received the, the medals. Alphabetical list of the Canadian militia and Indian warriors whose claims on medals for cooperating with the British troops at the actions of Detroit, Shattergate, and Chrysler Farm uh, has been investigated by the Board of Canadian Officers at Montreal, blah, 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 in uh, 1947. So when, uh, sorry, 1847, 20, 25th August. So I, I did a little chart there. I transcribed everything, which is in the little booklet of the uh, Warriors of 1812 that's online at Library and Archives Canada. So it starts with the uh, Euro Canadians part of the militia. And then oops, it starts with those, uh, those warriors with alphabetical lists, on an alphabetical list. And we see that Dominique Duchamp, the so called captain of the Indian department, is there. So, in order to associate them, for instance, we have uh, Atenhara, Inyas, which one's the Charles there? Oh, yes, Arenokta Saro. Let's say we have Charles Arenokta, phonetically Araokta, married. October 23rd in Ganawagi. We see in the index of the parish registers the name is there and it suits the years. Uh, I omitted to write that it was October 23rd, 1812. So a bunch married around 1812, 1813, 1814. So we have uh, their position after their name, Rent, Warrior, Lieutenant, Warrior, Captain, the action, Chattagate, Detroit, and the date of action of the combat. Here, that's a, a collector from, uh, where was he from? This collector was from, uh, yeah, from Michigan, a Vietnam warrior, a Vietnam uh, veteran. He took a picture of uh, something that he acquired. Within the first eight pages of the 1851 census, we see Dominic Duchamp qualified as captain of the Indians, the Indian department, who managed certain actions along the militia. That's my ad. And uh, he married Agathe de la Rimi. And who was Agathe de la Rimi? The daughter of Claude Nicolas de la Rimi, Indian agent in Ganawagi, who also married a Mohawk. Uh, he married two Mohawks, actually. Uh, his father-in-law is also an Indian agent, so today it would be an, an absolute conflict of interest, though that's well, how it went then. <laughs> so we see the wedding, uh, Dominique Duchamp and Agathe de Ragni, they got married in Ganawagi, and we see that uh, contrary to what people say that uh, the priests were trying to hide stuff, so we see that it was excessively detailed. Uh, he exposes that Jean-Marie Duchamp is from late Marie-Roi Portelance, his father from the Paroisse of Saint-Ange Parish, uh, A.K. Lachine, and Miss Agathe de Rémier, uh, minor daughter of Sir Guillaume de la Rémier, uh, commandant-in-chief of, of this village since the wedding occurred in Yanawagi. So it was all very very, very clear, the parish register, contrary to what many people say. Though Dominique Duchamp, before he was the uh, militia agent in Ganesatagi, he's the one who uh, became the first known white settler in Kakuna. He obtained 
1,281 acres of land from several tribes for two barrels of rum and a few other gifts. And it's written in many, if you type down uh, Dominique Duchamp through Google and uh, Wisconsin, you'll find all the, the sources. We have the, the contract, how uh, he, he traded with the uh, witness work of Mark of Wabasi with the sign Pine and the Eagle, Mark of Tabanoa, Black Tobacco. So that's the transcription of the archives from uh, Wisconsin uh, archives website. The session to Dominique Duchamp at Kakuna, 198. One barrel of rum to satisfy the undersigned. <laughs> and there's even a plate uh, in uh, Kakuna from the uh, Library of Kakuna, also mentioning it. That's the picture of Dominique Duchamp's house. And next, with uh, on the left side, was like the, the his little first uh, fur trade post in Kakuna. Also, uh, the Battle of uh, Beaver Dams was also uh, entitled the Battle of Beechwood. So I discovered that lately in uh, another piece of archives. Uh, weirdly, I, I, I was searching for stuff on Dominic Duchamp, and it was on Ancestry. Somebody put the chapter of a book from Ernest Cruikshank. Uh, Back then, a uh, very cartographic, geographic man, very well-known historian, mostly cart cartographic man, cartography. So he exposes the role of Dominique Cham and the, the de Lorimier back then on the Battle of uh, Beaver Dance. So uh, he's uh, qualified as a commander of the Captain Dominique Cham of the Iroquois. Lee, uh, little militia. The force has been organized at Montreal by Sir John Johnson of Indian Affairs. Originally consisted of 160 warriors from Sault Saint Louis, aka Kanawagi, 120 from Lake of Two Mountains, aka Yamisetagi, and 60 from Saint Regis, aka Aquasasne, under the general command of Dominique Cham, assisted by Lieutenant Jean Baptiste de Larimier. Uh, Gideon Goucher, Louis Langlade, Evangelist Saint Germain, and Isaac Leclerc. Some were managing the Huron militia, some the Abenaki militia, some the Algonquins, and some uh, most like with Nipissing, mostly. So, very interesting document to see. Uh, so, you can, I suggest you take that, that title, it's, uh, it's worth checking. Also, awkwardly, uh, like lately, people changed the name of the street uh, Amherst because of the. Uh, he wanted to give back then uh, sheets with, uh, with uh, sicknesses and fever and so on. So, <laughs> so uh, Dominique Cham, though nobody ever, uh, ever tried to to change nothing, even though he did. He did pretty crooked things back then uh, with a barrel of uh, alcohol, buying a huge, huge piece of land from natives and so on. Though the Morning Chronicle at Shipping Gazette exposes he passed away on Fort August 1853. Unfortunately, the parish register is unreadable. It's all uh, it's, it's not in good condition. So, uh, there's a main building, it's called Lisifis Dominique de Charme, uh, at the entrance of Old Montreal. It's actually uh, the, the building of Patrimony Canada, <laughs> and it's called the, uh, the Dominique de Charme building. Still internized at his name, even though he did pretty strange things. Here's the building, you see, it's by Yves Ashe, picture from the website of City of Montreal. Oops, a little history of the making there. Here we go. 16, uh, 1765, 1853. Oops, fur trader, interpret. And then uh, he explains that uh, 
he explains that the the, the, bat- the, the victory of the, the battle of uh, Biradam is really sober and he's exposing that none of our officers were uh, hurt we had 16 savages that were killed 20 that were hurt uh, the enemy had 150 killed 150 uh, hurt 601 prisoners and he explains that it was all because of the Mohawks that they won that war and it's not because of that part of the militia or that you know the the managers of the militias he was really sober and he wanted that the Mohawks to be recognized so we see him on the 1851 census Dominique Duchamp with Agathe de la uh, so he's qualified as captain of the Indian department Back then, it was called La Mission du Lac, Mission of the Lake of Snow Mountains. So, in order to associate those in the names in the, the names of those that receive medals, we have to analyze the census, and it's really everybody wrote the names completely differently. The the the, the military archives, those that were responsible, that wrote names of those that were hurt and so on during the war it was very confusing trying to associate the pronounce the right pronunciation one is Kiora Quinte Kiora Quinte Pierre sometimes Peter so that's how we we have to compare from a census to another it's, it's a real mess sometimes <laughs> so by following the names like that because they were all in alphabetical order also, the many uh, newspapers, archives are citing uh, people that passed away that were veterans of the War of 1812. If you go on the website of, uh, I know that for BA and Q Archives of Quebec, the newspapers, archives, you type down 1812 warriors, uh, Indians, uh, you'll find a bunch of uh, obituaries mentioning those who took part in the war, not only Mohawks, but from all over. So those mainly that that men that were brought uh, into the warriors militia were those from the missions of the St. Lawrence River. So there was Oswegatchi back then uh, at the entrance of Ontario, Agwasasne, Ganesatagi, Ganawagi, Odanak, the, uh, the Abenakis, and Lorette, the Wendat books. So. Uh, the union of the seven of the seven nations it's it started a while ago uh, from the american revolution basically and then uh, basically it became an it became like a too heavy to maintain relationships with them with those who took part in the wars and so on and to because they kept giving gifts to the families of warriors yearly Sometimes I think it was like tri-monthly, something like that. They didn't want to provide more funds for the natives, so they created the reserves. They, they participated in the War of 1812. 1846, they got the medals. Oops, 1851, the reserves were created. And once you're in the reserve, you need a permit to leave the reserve. So somehow, uh, so we see now the, the main missions of those that took part in the Seven Nations. So that's one of the a flag that was on the uh, uh, on the monument in Ganawagi of those uh, of the veterans. Very interesting. Those are, that were uh, killed and wounded in the military archives. We uh, that's another newspaper article from the Bay and, uh, Library and Archives Canada, uh, Quebec, from Gazette of Quebec, 1813. Mentions of Dominique Duchamp. There's really a bunch of archives. And now the, ar- the military archives of uh, those killed or wounded. The, we see that the names were really not properly written. There was a, a complete mess to conduct the associations. So we still managed to, uh, to be able to phonetically associate them. Those killed and wounded. 
it's also exposed in the booklet of uh, 1812 that's online books the different names so we can see that back then beaver dam it was written by a french b-i-v-e-r-d-a-m-e -E. <laughs> some uh, people that were wounded uh, mentioned at beaver dams on june 24 1813 i certified that the surname ignace Taguayanan was wounded in action of Beaver Dam. He says he cannot use poop poop, his arm, perhaps, being wounded at two places. Captain Isaac Leclerc testifying. Louis Langlade was another agent testifying. Of Louis Kissensick was a Nipissing chief that lived in Oka a few months a year. Uh, another one, he got a compound fracture of the arm occasioned by a musket ball, an Abenaki uh, chief. Also, another important point, uh, the U.S. expansionism-wise, uh, demographical-wise, uh, the most, the main expansionism, the population focused on the borders as, uh, in terms of protectionism, through expansion between around 1790 to 1820. So in that period, most families had uh, around eight children, which uh, from which four usually survived. Uh, so the population doubled between 1790 to 1820. So uh, it, it created a, an enormous expansionism and growth, quick development and uh, big pressure sociologically and economically. So after the Revolutionary War of the States, uh, Great Britain agreed to abandon all the territories that were ceded to U.S. As we then the U.S. the U.S. not having the military capacities, they were unable to drive the British out of the border. So that it, it kept on happening until around 1820. <laughs> the reluctance of the British uh, crown to mostly around the Great Lakes and uh, towards the western uh, provinces as well. And then not so late after, around 1807, uh, Major then General of the U.S. Troop William Hall, he uh, mostly uh, decreased the standing of the First Nations. On, on, on November 17, 1807, the Treaty of Detroit was signed by Chippewas, Ottawas, Wendats, Potawatomis, uh, and the treaty gave the United States claim to the remainder of Ohio and the majority of the, the areas of Michigan in exchange for a renewed peace between settlers and Indians. <laughs> Though the settlers having occupied the treaty lands, uh, they, they, they kept encroaching on any lands, and uh, Hall refused to punish those settlers <laughs> who were encroaching on any lands. So therefore, the, 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 the relationship of trust was absolutely broken. Who's left in 1812, the First Nations, they betrayed, well, they left the U.S. troops, and they, uh, they united with uh, the British from uh, Upper Canada, mostly. Of course, it started when the ships uh, starting uh, started capturing American sailors around 1807. That's... Uh, uh, it, it, it all started pretty much at the same. So they got betrayed by uh, the troops of William Hall in 1807. And in 1807 also occurred the, uh, the British ships forcing American uh, captured sailors to join the Royal Navy. So that all, all those facts gathered all together. Actual uh, lesson behind the story, if we could say, uh, it was really like a question of opportunity for the crown or for the states to get uh, 
Indian allies through their militias. Since uh, at the end, uh, seemingly, natives became a burden of the state since the creation of the reserves occurred right after they got their medals. So, <laughs> therefore, uh, it's a little like void of nullity when we're talking about uh, the great unions between First Nations and the Crown or the, the United States. Since uh, when the help of First Nation was uh, concluded, they took what they needed on both parties. Then you just uh, create the reserves and uh, they start afterwards the residential schools. And uh, as we know, the outcomes of... Uh, of all those uh, mischiefs, it's uh, it's a it's a pretty uh, divided population right now in native communities. Uh, many also got uh, got uh, got religiously they got Christians. Uh, a lot of people are going towards uh, traditionalism, and so on. So there's there's quite a few divisions. Uh, many wants to remain, uh, let's say, traditionalists, while others are going on the academic, pursuing an academic life. And it's also sometimes a little bit confusing, because when we're talking about academic life, um, it's quite often, uh, I, 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 I wrote something yesterday. That sociological observation. Many natives heading through academic entities, through working and or sometimes simply by joining programs, very often fall in the caste-suggested personality of Euro-academic behaviorism, losing their own identities, slowly becoming Occidental bourgeois in a very subtle way, basically without noticing how they are now conducting themselves. So it's really like a remolding sociologically that's happening in native communities since the colonies and since the previous unions with either the French, the US or the English crowns or entities. So that was it for my presentation and uh, I would be delighted to provide uh, more information uh, to whoever needs some. So thank you. Bye-bye.